Ah, the graphics cards. What a beauty, isn't she? This bad boy can render this many billions of triangles in only 16 milliseconds. And, um, well, um, right, what else can it do? Alright, but all jokes aside though, the GPU is a phenomenal piece of modern electrical engineering and it is truly a waste to just let it sit there and do nothing, while your CPU is just struggling so bad it's barely not overheating. So let's talk about OpenCL. A quick note before I do though, if you're enjoying my content then please hit that subscribe button, it really means the world to me if you do. And I guess you can always change your mind later. So anyway, OpenCL is a framework for writing programs that can run on, quote unquote, hardware accelerators. This usually just means graphics cards, so that is what we will focus on in this video. OpenCL specifies a C-like programming language that allows you to program your GPU, and it allows you to interface between this GPU program and your regular CPU code. So to begin with, you'll have to get OpenCL on your computer and link it up with your C, C++ project. This is pretty straightforward, so I won't spend too much time on this. If you're stuck, there is a link in the description to a blog post that has a pretty good job explaining everything. Also a quick note for if you prefer C Sharp, OpenTK has the OpenTK computing.opencl namespace. This contains everything that you need to get started with OpenCL in C Sharp. And just like with OpenGL, all the functions in OpenTK will look and behave almost identically to those in C and C++. So you should be able to follow this video as well. Alright, now let's get to the juicy stuff here. First, we can get a list of OpenCL platforms using the function clGetPlatformIDs. I won't go into too much detail because the API is pretty self-explanatory, but just for this first function, I'll say that OpenCL is a C-based API and so all of these functions use pointers and basic value types. So the platform ID list that we need here is just a platform ID pointer combined with an unsigned integer to specify the size. Also, most of these functions will return a CL result. This simply tells you if the function executed with GL success or if anything bad happened. It's useful to check these just to make sure that everything is okay. Next up, we can get the physical device associated with each platform by calling clGetDeviceIDs. Here, you can specify what type of device you want to use. So you'll probably want to use CL device type GPU. But there are some other types that might have some niche uses. You can check out of this in the OpenCL specs, of course. Another useful thing to do here is to rate each device and finally use the device with the highest rating. A user PC might, for example, have one integrated GPU and one dedicated GPU. If you just use the first device that you find, you might end up using the integrated GPU for running your code on, while you probably wanted the dedicated one. You can use clGetDeviceInfo to query basically anything you would ever want to know about the device. So hopefully you can make some informed decisions about which device you actually want to use. Then we can create the OpenCL context using three guesses. Well, yes, CL create context, of course. This, of course, takes in the device we just chose. In principle, you could use multiple devices for your context, but this is usually not what you want. The OpenCL context will basically manage all of your other OpenCL objects from now on. Now, the last part of the initialization procedure is to create the command queue. With, of course, CL create command queue or CL create command queue with properties. Here, you really can only use one device per command queue, or rather, one command queue per device. The command queue also just kind of does what it says. It's a queue where you can unqueue commands for your device, something like run this program, for example, or upload this buffer. Anyway, we now have everything that we need to actually load our program. So let us do that by calling CL create program with source and then CL build program. If you want to, you can check the build status by calling CL get program build info. If the build failed, because maybe you made some syntax error in your code, for example, then this will tell you exactly what you did wrong. Not strictly necessary, but incredibly useful. With our program, we can now create the kernel, which is the entry function within your program that we're going to have to call from the CPU side. We can do this by calling clCreateKernel. Make sure that the kernel name parameter matches exactly with the name of your entry function. 
Now to actually run our program or kernel, we should first upload the parameters for the kernel to the device. We can do that by calling cl set kernel arc. This uses an index to set every parameter or argument of your kernel. Set index 0 is simply the first argument, index 1 is the second, and so on. You probably want to use OpenCL buffers here because those can be stored on the GPU for longer periods of time. So you don't have to re-upload the same parameters over and over every frame. You can create a buffer with CL create buffer. You can then set the buffer data by calling CL unqueue write buffer. We will be using two read-only buffers for input and one write-only buffer for output. Of course, we don't have to set any data for the write buffer. And the read buffers can just be populated by any old C style or C++ style array. Once all the arguments are set, we can unqueue the kernel to the command queue. We do this by calling cl unqueue nd range kernel. This one might be a little bit more confusing than the other functions though. CL unqueue nd range kernel needs you to specify a work dimension, a global work offset, a global work size, and a local work size. The work dimension simply specifies how many spatial dimensions you want to use. This can be useful for if you want to do something for every pixel on a screen, for example, because a screen has two dimensions, so work dimension is two then. If you are just working with arrays, then work dimension is just one. The global work offset is the easiest of the bunch because this just always must be zero. But OpenCL might use this parameter in the future. Now, global work size is the number of runs you want to do per dimension. So let's take our once per pixel on our screen example. If we have a screen of 1920 by 1080, then the global work size of the first dimension will be 1920 and the global work size of the second will be 1080. And local work size is the number of threads you want to run per GPU group per dimension. A work group on my GPU is basically a small number of cores that share memory. The total number of cores in such a group can be different per GPU, so you should check what that is for your device by calling CL get device info. Then make sure that the total of local work size, so local work size 0 times local work size 1 times local work size 2 and so on, is never greater than this total number of cores per work group. Otherwise your program cannot run. You might be wondering, well, why would I ever want to use fewer cores per work group than the maximum? Well, remember that a work group shares memory. So if you're using a lot of memory per core, this shared memory can completely get filled up. And that can cause a lot of issues. Your program might actually get a lot slower than if you had used fewer cores. Or your program might just not run at all. Some tweaking and some testing might be required for this one. So CL unqueue ND range kernel also allows you to tell the queue that it should wait with executing your kernel until some CL event has passed. We won't be using that here, but it can be quite useful. It also allows you to store the event object of the kernel you are unqueuing. So you could then use this event to wait on some other operation until this kernel has finished executing. Again, we won't be using that here, but it can be quite useful. And then finally, to actually run the kernel, we can do that by calling clflush or clfinish. clflush will pass all the queued up commands in the command queue to the appropriate device and then run them. It will just return after that, so usually the GPU will still be busy when clflush returns. This is useful for if you want to do some other stuff in the meantime on the CPU. You can later use CL wait for events to wait until you're sure that all your kernels have finished. CL finish on the other hand will pass all the queued up commands from the command queue to the appropriate device and it will wait until all of those commands have finished. So when this function returns you can be absolutely sure that your kernel has finished. And lastly we can retrieve the data written to our write only buffer by calling cl unqueue read buffer. We can just store the results in a normal C++ array now and access its contents like we normally would. In this project, we'll just write everything to the console. Well, that was quite a setup, but well, we are far from done, my friends. Now it's time to actually talk about how we can make an OpenCL program or kernel. First of all, the GPU of course is not exactly the same as a CPU. So for if you didn't know this yet, a GPU has thousands of tiny little cores, whereas a CPU usually only has a couple of really big ones. 
This basically means that the GPU is optimized for massive parallel tasks. So you should write your code accordingly. If you want to add the values from one array to those from another array, then you don't just loop through them and add them one by one. Instead, you create thousands of little threads that all add up exactly and only one index of the arrays. This will probably take some getting used to, but don't worry. The performance gain from using a GPU is so enormous that it will be well worth the effort of learning how to use it. Then the OpenCL programming language itself is based on C, so a lot of it will seem familiar. But it does have a couple of distinct features that we should probably talk about. First off, it has built-in vector types. If you want a 3D vector of floats, you can just type float3. If you want an 8D vector of unsigned integers, you can use uint8. So basically, you first write the type and then the dimension. OpenCL supports 2, 3, 4, 8 and 16 dimensional vectors. Next up are the address space specifiers. These are global, local, constant and private. These can be written with or without an underscore underscore prefix. So keep that in mind when reading through examples and such. The global specifier can be used for many things, but it is usually seen when storing buffers. Anything stored with the global specifier can be accessed from anywhere in the program and will stay in memory until that program is deleted. The same is true for the constant specifier, but constant can only be used for read-only data. It's quite useful to store data in global memory, but do keep in mind that global memory is usually slower than local memory. The local specifier can be used for the data that is only shared between a single work group. So if your local work size is 64 and your global work size is 512, then you will be running eight work groups that each have their own local storage. The private specifier is used for data that can only be accessed by the thread that is using it. We're basically talking about variables inside of functions or function parameters, stuff like that. You don't even have to write down private in these cases, since the compiler will usually do this for you. Alright, I think these were the most important bits about the CL programming language. But there are a whole lot more of useful bits and bobs in here. So please do read the specification if you're interested. The link is in the description, of course. Now, let us make a kernel that will take in two arrays and output the sum of these two in another array. So let's make a new file and call it vectorsum.cl and then we can call the entry function or kernel underscore underscore kernel void vectorsum constant float pointer a constant float pointer b global float pointer c. Then in the function we can get the index that we should be adding up by calling, and this is important, get global id zero. This will return the index of the current global thread in dimension zero. So if we are iterating over an image of size 200 by 300, then get global id 0 will return an integer between 0 and 200, and get global id 1 will return an integer between 0 and 300. Since we are only adding up two arrays here, we only have to worry about one dimension, so stating that int i equals get global id 0 will be enough. Then we can do the addition, so float sum equals ai plus bi. And lastly, we can write the result to the output array c with c i equals sum. And really, that should already be it. We're just adding up two arrays. So let us load in the file as a text file inside of our program. It doesn't really matter how you do it. And then we can use that to construct our program, as we talked about earlier in this video. Then to create the kernel, make sure that you set the kernel name to vector sum. The only thing left to do now is to set the arguments and run the program. We will set vector a to have a size of 256, where every index has the value of the index squared. Vector b will have a size of 256 as well, but here every index just has the value of the index. So we are expecting the result to be a 256 sized vector as well, where every index is the index plus the index squared. Now let us run it. And well, there we go. A whole list of integers that do indeed follow the index plus index squared rule. Perfect. And there we have it folks. A simple program in OpenCL. Well, I do realize that we have only scratched the surface of all the wonderful things that are possible with OpenCL. I will definitely make another video on this in the future. 
Maybe I could also make a video that goes more in depth on what a GPU really is, how it works and how you can write code to fully take advantage of it. That would be interesting. This video has been long enough though, so I'm gonna end it here. If you're new to the channel and you enjoyed the video, then please consider subscribing. That would really mean the world to me. And if you have any questions after this, then you can leave those in the comments or join our Discord server and ask it there. We have a wonderful community over there who would love to help you out. Also, I stream every weekday from 8 to 10 p.m. CEST. It's a lot of fun, so be sure to drop by sometime. Anyway, that was really it. See you soon, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.